This is your Libertarian Crusaders podcast show, and this is your episode number 41. And today we have Richard Story with us, who is going to, uh, we're going to do a fun back and forth in a way of a discussion on why the West is the best. Aside from, uh, I like to always point out that we, we don't eat cats, you know, it's not a normal part of our diet. Um, but Richard Story has uh, created, a, wrote a book called The Uniqueness of Western Law actionary manifesto and i think western law is actually a really good uh first topic when we talk about western uh civilization or why the west is the best and there's a lot of things that we take kind of for granted here that seems some common sense but it's not so much in the rest of the world like uh the presumption of innocence before proven guilty is an interesting unique one um but I want to, before we dove into it, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came across writing this book? Well, I mean, I, I was studying law and I have a master's in law. And during, during my studies, I found myself a little bit irritated um, with changes to the law, you know, brought about certainly by EU law as it was then. And, you know, I, I was always getting into disagreements with my tutors. Um, you know, for instance, I, I would ask things like, well, what happens if Britain decides they want to leave the EU? I mean, everyone in the room would just laugh at me. Um, you know, uh, I'm the one laughing now. Um, but uh, I, I found myself just irritated with the um, modern conceptions that have been brought into British law. I found myself irritated with um, the fundamental statism, which was assumed in the study of law, even though that that was not the foundations of, of British law or of Western law overall. And I was much more interested in studying historical Western law. I was much interested in much more interested in the theory. And so, the big question that was in my mind was, what? made the West so unique that even up until the 1500s, the rise of modernity, there was this advanced civilization and it didn't have a state. There was no state. Why was that the case? Why was it that um, the more honest scholars that I encountered would say that for Western civilization, law is uniquely central to our civilization, to the extent that many of them would say that um, law is uniquely Western, in the sense that in other civilizations, you would have what uh, or used to be called commonly the Oriental despot. You know, you'd have a figure who presented themselves as some sort of sun god or something like that, you know, certainly in the ancient world anyway. And uh, law was simply their fiat. It was what they said. It was something that was what we, we would understand now as positively legislate for the people. In the West, it's completely different. There's, there's something that is rationally discovered. It's something that's ob objective. Um, law is something that rules over kings. In a certain sense, it is the the king of kings. Um, and so I wanted to understand how did that happen? What caused that? Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was basically the journey, you know, during my studies, um, doing my own research, which I found far more interesting, and, uh, and writing this book. And thankfully, uh, a lot of uh, scholars who I uh, talked with along the way some of them, uh, names you would probably be familiar with, some libertarian scholars. I got to know them better, and I got some nice advanced praise for the book. And, um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think a great way to just kind of start um, this dialogue then is uh, from that, uh, how do you define the West, right? Uh, is it this a big conglomerate? Uh, it's not a super state. Uh, there's a lot of uh, countries uh, that share a uh, history. Um, some kind of linkness to that. How would you define then uh, the West before we define like how is it the best? But you know what is considered defined as the West? Well, at one time, not that long ago, we wouldn't really 
have used the term Western civilization that much. We might have said something like Christendom. Mm -hmm. um, um, for me, uh, and I, I think really for, for most of us, when you say Western civilization, we're talking about Europe and we're talking about the extended Europe uh, that was created um, not mostly by the the Anglo's, but you know just generally by the Europeans um, around the world, and the um, you know as we said, law is very central to that, and so it's it's the unique um, attitudes towards governance um, that we that we have um, was well, certainly that we had in the past. I think. Um, uh, much of our more, how can I put it, um, our more um, libertarian perceptions of the law, you know, principles that we might uh, broadly agree with, certainly on this show, um, they, they, they have been eroded in, in lots of ways. I think um, what we have reigning now is more a sort of modern liberalism. I see this as being largely a perversion of... Um, the the thought, which was really fundamentally Christian, which um, developed what we call Western civilization and certainly undergirded um, everything that we would call Western law. Um, I was reading uh, I was reading one of your articles in preparation, and I noticed uh, that that concept where you talked. Um, it was an article entitled uh, "How to Define the Right," and it goes into um, the nine points of uh, the distributist. Uh, and uh, he, one point I thought really drove it home for me where it, along these lines, you said, um, I must conclude by agreeing with the underappreciated father, Aidan Nichols, that the Anglosphere owes all of its truly conserving and ordering institutions and traditions ultimately to the Albion of Catholic England from the attire to our judges, to the rituals of our politics and military the secularized Anglosphere animates itself on the skeleton of Christendom. And when we talk of the right, we're talking of approximations to that former order. We can no more escape that, that context than a fish can jump and jump on land and start a new life. And I thought that was really a concise way of, of explaining that. Um, just the idea of what we have today isn't necessarily, you know, other, like you said, uh, they would describe it as Christendom, not necessarily the Western civilization. And that's where it's, it's uh, these, these, the law is drawn from. Yeah, thank you for that. That's actually much better than what I said. So thank you for reminding me of something I wrote earlier. That's much better than my own with. That's, that's good. Um, uh, yeah, I agree with myself. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's just impossible to ignore. And I mean, the reason I wrote that article in particular is because uh, the, the distributist, who is a brilliant thinker, very original thinker on YouTube, you know, I recommend him. To, to everyone. But um, I think with, with the article, he was trying to look at, well, what can we broadly describe as the right wing? I think he's trying to look for a, a bigger tent movement. Uh, what I was trying to do with my book was just to say, no, sorry, <laughs> um, what we call the West and um, Christianity is basically an integral fundamentally important development of the West. It's not a discontinuation, which a lot of people on the dissident right would say it is. Uh, you know, people who would be interested in Nietzsche, um, Julius Evola, uh, you know, I could go on, uh, different thinkers who were um, kind of reactionary to that Christianity. I mean, they don't really have anywhere to go. Um, Really, um, Christendom was a definite continuation of uh, the Roman project, um, which was to, again, uh, to discover these rational laws, these, these principles. And, you know, Rome wanted to unite all of the, the, the disparate tribes, um, certainly of Europe. They wanted to control the Mediterranean fundamentally, um, to... Uh, Facilitate, facilitate trade, obviously, but in order to, do, to create the kind of peace and order that they saw as the ideal. There was something very metaphysical about this as well, uh, religious. Um, Christianity, 
undoubtedly. And, you know, again, this is something I argue in my book. Um, and it, it, it wasn't just uh, lib, um, old writers and that kind of thing that I was targeting. I also wanted to question libertarians, uh, what, what I would call um, modern or modernist libertarians, who are very hyper-individualistic uh, in their outlook, certainly when it comes to thinking about things like, um, well, even the family. Uh, but also, you know, nations in, um, you know, in, in, in even, you know, more, you know, ethnic sense or something like that, or um, various kinds of communities, which would just have been assumed were natural and, and normal, a part of the natural order before. Um, so, yeah, really with my book, I wanted to say um, Christianity is, is where it's out. It's fundamental to the identity of Western civilization, what we would call Western civilization and Western law. Um, it was, a, to say it was a significant development in Western law is an understatement. With canon law was the first proper systematization of different kinds of law throughout Europe that has you know, ever existed. Right. I think that's also kind of you find that in uh, acts of war uh, and declaration of war, having a causa bellum and these types of um, uh, notions from Christianity has been embedded in the way how we uh, fight with other countries uh, or even like the beginnings of uh, an international law system that affects not just the home country, but uh, colonies and other places uh, across the globe. Um, what what areas like my 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 favorite part here is the uniqueness of it um but like compared to what right that's always the question like why is the best compared to what uh could you give us some examples of why the best the west is the best or christendom <laughs> right is the best uh compared to what well i mean at some points i'm almost tempted in my book to say well, you know, it's it's the best for me, you know, almost adopting this kind of relativistic thing. But, okay, the, the, but there is a legitimate sense in that it is. It, it is the best for me because, um, you know, Christendom, okay, this, this, is, this is the civilization of, of my ancestors and it, it makes sense to me. And, and I think that um, the... Uh, more more individualistic um, attitudes towards the law, which were which were respected and which were synthesized um, by uh, by canon law, and which have been in, in Western Western law. Um, so that, for instance, let me give you an example um, with earlier Roman law. Um, the pater familias, so the the head of the family could brutalize um, his family. You know, we, we get that word, brutalize, from a Roman figure who uh, uh, had his sons killed, or killed his sons even, I should say, um, over something which we might consider to be quite petty, really, or not really worth killing your children. With Christianity came this understanding that um, an individual will be accountable before God. And so that goes, that goes for children, that goes for women as well. And so there was introduced a recourse through the law for women and children um, to, uh, well, yes, you know, to, to have some legal recourse against a brutalistic uh, husband, you know, a, a tyrannical father, we might say. And so th th this this idea, which works out from the family, it, it, it works into what we would call subsidiarity. And subsidiarity is a very very important part of Western law. Um, it's that that tradition is the tradition of the American Republic, as the the, the Protestant um, uh, side of subsidiarity. Um, it's why Switzerland is the way that it is, and the idea is basically. Um, this, this traditional Christian doctrine means that uh, decisions should be made as locally as possible, as close to the individual or as close to the family as possible. Um, and, you know, I think that suits us very much as European people. I think we, we, we look at that and we say, oh, yeah, that's great. That's, that's, that's really nice. Um, perhaps in much more collectivistic 
uh, societies, say in 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 China or um, or even in Islamic civilization, I would say, certainly historically, um, they w- would not have found that to be so attractive. Um, and I, I think there are important reasons for that. I think there are important reasons for that. And, um, you know, I try to go into that in the book. You know, I, I think that there is something about the, the psyche of European people or which is attracted towards individualism. And, and I think it can go very wrong. And I think um, certainly throughout modernity, we have uh, indulged um, modern liberalism, you know, which, is, which is basically a hyper-individualization. It uh, leads to people... Um, thinking that it's it's good to be completely atomized, you know, in a sense. Whereas I think that just makes us very, very vulnerable to the state. In fact, it necessitates the state. Um, but for other civilizations, um, this, you know, liberal idea, um, okay, it might be attractive in some senses, you know, they see American stuff, you get lots of stuff and and they kind of associate all the younger generations associated with sexual license as well. So in in that sense, what we call westernization or Americanization can get some traction um, in in other different civilizations. Um, but you know, for instance, with, with China, um, I it, it's it's just not surprising that they would have a very different civilization. And that they would look at things like that and they say, well, well, this is not really for us. Nevertheless, okay, all of that said, I do think that the, the principles, the rational principles that have been identified in Western law and that are identified in, um, in Christianity, so in Christian theology, it's impossible to ignore the theology. That's a different topic. But um, I, I think that that is obviously, being a Christian, I would say this, of universal importance. I think it's of universal application to all people. I think it it had to, and it couldn't have begun anywhere else other than in the the Greco-Roman world, which is very unique. And uh, but, But nevertheless, I do think that that Roman project, trying to unite all the disparate tribes and to create peace, um, I think that that is perfected in Christianity, where it's not just being imposed by a conquering army and by the emperor saying, yeah, okay, you can have your gods, but this is what's at the top of the totem. Um, with Christ, when Christ came, this is a total redefining of love. And this meant that the Roman Empire could be created, not something imposed from the outside, but it could be something that reigns within men's hearts. And so it's something that people genuinely want to be involved in. And and that is why it was more successful in uniting Europe than was the pagan Roman Empire of old. Um, I think I've answered your question. I'm sorry if I kind of derailed a little bit. Could other uh, paternal uh, order of things in other parts of the world, you know, you have uh, honor killings that still continue today, right? So the judgment is like, it's not just outside of the state, but uh, down in those kind of uh, smaller collective units. And, but that's not just like an idea that one familial collective unit has. That's like a cultural idea that permeates through like many places of India, Pakistan, a lot of mm-hmm. Middle East, um, that the judgment or like what the child has done or even the wife is already handed down and uh, sentenced right there and then now without having them to kind of have to respond to that themselves or be judged by God. Um, and that even goes, uh, further. I think, uh, yeah, that's, as you could mention that you, you bring that up and bringing most of these kind of legal systems, they've provide more protection for them. I was reading this one thing about how, uh, girls, for example, used to be just casted off, uh, Roman times. This is when early Christianity starts to form. And because, you know, girls are not uh, useful in farms, right? It's like the problem that China's having right now, but now they have too many males versus uh, women there for them to find marriages or prospects. Uh, and that 
practice of uh, just tossing girls into the streets when they were born uh, ended because they find that each one of us are children of God. Um, and so it should be valued and looked after just as well. Um, and I think that's kind of a unique thing as well in Western civilization. We don't <laughs> throw our kids and cast them off into the woods. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, aside from law, there's other interesting attributes that a lot of people like today, for example, there's this, uh, illness, I call it, or misinformation of cultural relativism of like everything is equal that uh, no, no such, no, nothing could be better than another. But that's, I find that to be only a unique thing here, maybe in, in Western culture part. But if you go to places like Japan, they think, no, we're the best. You know, even though they've lost a war, war, they think, you know, we're still the best. Even when uh, South Korea asked them to apologize for uh, their involvement in the country um, with the uh, Nanjing rape incident, Japan doesn't care, they scoff, and they still think, they're the best. They're not going to apologize to anybody. Uh, the Mongols are not going to apologize to anybody for Genghis Khan. Uh, you know, this his face of this great warrior for them conquers on their coin, right? So they have an enormous statue to him. There, there are other countries out there or cultures are apologizing for being themselves and being that for, for where they come from. And no one wants to say that they're second best. But interestingly, uh, here, like in America, you have that. You have an interesting, is, is what, you know, what the result of that is from, is it Marxism? Is a bad education? You know, um, not understanding where history is coming from or uh, distilling that information. But, uh, which kind of makes sense because if it's, this country was formed mostly by Protestantism, they're going to forsake a lot of the achievement of Catholicism and not introduce that into history textbooks. They're going to chew Christopher Columbus, for example, and make him out of villain in a majority Protestant country. Uh, you're going to hear uh, the destruction of the Catholic Spanish Armada, but you'll never hear anything about the English Armada that came right afterwards and also came to the same similar destruction off the coast of Spain. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's uh, something that is a problem here, is an illness um, in terms of why is it hard for people to say, like America, they have no problem saying America is the best sometimes, but often today now they're saying it's the worst. It's like the most evil thing ever. Um, there, it's, uh, what, what do you have to say to that, to, I guess, the current state that we're in when in large part of England, where you're at even, where they're taking down uh, statues uh, in your country and saying that it's, uh, how dare you think that England could be great or could be the best? Yeah, it's a very important question. Um, as I said, you know, I, I, I see in modernity that we've become very, very hyper individualistic and we've become very atomat atomized. And I see that as being very dangerous. We're essentially left without a proper holistic identity in all of the ways which we fundamentally need. Um, and the, the reason for that that I perceive, it's, it, it doesn't just go back to um, Protestantism, the rise of Protestantism. And I mean, of course, that is very important. Um, liberalism, modern liberalism, in some very, very important ways, was allowed to flourish because of the Protestant revolts and because um, in Protestant countries, they wanted to introduce pluralism. So they wanted to introduce the, the concept of allowing a plurality of religions and thus different cultures. And so when this eventually broke down until you have what we have today, modern liberalism, which is the, uh, the, the belief that there are no public beliefs. There's no public belief. All beliefs are private. All beliefs are privatized. And, uh, and there is no public belief other than that belief that all beliefs are private. And so, you know, with that, and, um, you know, so sadly, I mean, that, um, that has been foundational in, you know, throughout the Anglo-American world. And so I think, you know, this, this is why we, we tend to have problems. And I think that our liberalism uh, that we share in, in our cultures um, that has 
permeated, whatever word you'd like to use, uh, other European countries, which were not really like that up until quite recently. Um, e even, you know, until after the first, after the second world war, sorry. Um, but it, it, it didn't start with the Protestant Reformation. I think, and you know, this is the theory that I have in my book. I think to understand the psychopathy of European people, we have to go back and we have to look at our ancestors. Um, I followed the work of uh, a brilliant thinker called Ricardo Duchenne, who was a professor at the University of New Brunswick, but they forced him into early retirement, I'm afraid, because he wanted to talk about you know, ancient Europeans and Nazi stuff like that. Um, which, you know, he's not in the slightest, he's Puerto Rican. He's not a white supremacist, but they, they didn't like him anyway. Um, so you look at our very ancient ancestors, we're talking like 10,000 BC to like 3000 BC, let's say, you know, to the time of like the Homeric epics, Homer's epics. And um, we're descended from, you know, what, what we call Indo-Europeans before people used to call them Aryans and stuff like that. But now we've got different terminology for all of it. Um, and these, these guys were um, nomads. So they, you know, they were not farmers. They were cattle drivers. Um, they, you know, had a very dairy heavy uh, diet. And so this is why um, Europeans are disproportionately lactose to uh, tolerant. Um, and uh, they, they engaged in berserker warfare. They would get naked. They paint themselves up with something. And they would just, you know, run at each other and, you know, completely, completely flout their lives um, with the hope of attaining, you know, immortal fame, eternal glory, like that. So these guys were clearly psychopaths, right? Um, in, the, in the proper sense of the word, not just like in a flippant, oh, you're crazy. They, they were psychopathic, very individualistic, and, um, and sort of so uncaring about their own lives, just so long as they can look good. Yeah. Just so long as they can have kudos from their peers. And really, this is where, this is where Western law comes from. This is why you had not just like the one king and he says exactly what goes, but you had, you know, an aristocracy. The king was always a first among equals. And, um, um, and, and, and that kind of competition uh, between people, that was what gave rise to philosophy and, and the, the, you know, the Greek, the Greek miracle, as it's called. Um, you know, the, the Greeks, you know, looked to the east, they saw the Phoenicians, they saw they had like this one king telling everyone what to do, said, no, 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 we don't want to go back to that. You know, we, we, we are rational. We can discover um, the principles of law, the objective, you know, um, idealistic, uh, Platonistic, abstract um, foundations of law. The logos, yeah, yeah? the logos. And um, so there was that competition, and that's what gave rise to, to, to Western law. And um, oh, you know what? I, I've forgotten where I was going with this. I knew where I was going. What was your question again? So I can just get back to where I was going. No, don't stop. Uh, I was just, <laughs> just talking uh, about... Psychopaths, that was it. Sorry, I'm back. I'm back. Psychopaths. Okay, I'm back. All right. So, um, in my opinion, because, you know, you know, half of European people are descended from just one of these kings, just one of these guys. So, so we are closely related and also... Um, we are, you know, very much descended from these people. And the data do show that European people are, you know, moderately psychopathic, not too far. So, you know, we engage in antisocial behavior. We're not sociopaths. Um, well, some of us are, you know, we've got C CEOs and politicians still, of course. But, um, uh, but generally, generally, we just are more individualistic and um, we we find it difficult to relate to collectives unless there are like really well entrenched ideas. You know, we need like 
we need flags and colors and songs. You know, we need a lot to really get us going. Um, uh, and, and even with the family, you know, look at our families, look at how the family has broken up um, to a large extent, you know, to a greater extent than perhaps you'd see in uh, East Asian countries. Um, and so you've got to ask yourselves, well, why is this happening? And I, I do just see um, the behavior of like virtue signaling and stuff. This whole thing of, um, um, oh, what's the meme? There's like the guy in the pool and the pool is just crammed and he's the only white guy in the pool and he's just saying, well, at least I wasn't racist. <laughs> Um, you know, that kind of, it's, it's, it's that kind of attitude towards something like immigration, which you just wouldn't see anywhere else. Other people don't think like that. You know, if I, if I speak with um, black friends of mine, oh, I have black friends. No, but, you know, if I speak with black friends, they say, why are you so liberal in this country? Why are you so liberal? We would never do that for you. This friend of mine said, I was like, well, yeah, I understand. And I, I have to explain to him. I said, well, we're psychopaths. <laughs> he laughs. I'm like, no, I'm serious. Um, I'm really serious. Um, we find it very difficult to um, just automatically, naturally engage in more collective behaviors. And that suited us very well. Yeah, you know, for the development of Western law, for um, being competitive and arriving at like really rationalistic principles and coming up with a new idea. And then we'll have competing schools of thought going on and stuff like that, which just didn't happen in, say, China. You know, in China, you had the sage wisdom. You weren't allowed to deviate from that. They kill you. You have your head cut off. How dare you offend? I don't really know many sages. I wouldn't be able to remember the name anyway. But how dare you offend this person? You can maybe adapt a little bit, but you can't, you know, innovate. Um, and so, okay, this slightly more individualistic paper has suited us very well. But again, this is, this is where we need Christianity. We need the concept of, you know, for, if, for example, in the Eucharist, this is something, you know, we are consuming, yes, and this is feeding, it has the, the, the idea of feeding and nourishing and, and bringing life. But also, very importantly, we are consumed also into the body of Christ. It's a very, it's, it's probably the strongest form of corporatism there is. Um, and so, you, you know, some Italian guy could look at a German guy and say, okay, well, that person is my brother. Um, and we are, you know, united in this mystical way, a way that is just beyond me in, in transcendent terms. And uh, no, I can't, I can't attack that person. In fact, I should be coming to their aid, if anything. Um, and so we need, you know, um, powerful ideas like that to transcend the self. Anyway, I'll shut up. Uh, no, do you think that, um, where, where are the places in Europe that are, are being successful at addressing these issues? Uh, I mean, I think of, uh, Hungary and I think of, um, I was just reading about Victor Orban and, and he, it said he describes his system as an illiberal democracy and he prefers to call it a Christian democracy. And I think that's an interesting uh, turn of phrase because you were just saying that, well, you know, why are you so liberal? We wouldn't do that to you, you know, in our country. And uh, he, it, it, by calling it, it, anytime you in the United States, if you call it, this is a Christian country. We, you know, if, if we say that it's like, whoa, that's, that's not true, you know? Um, and uh, it, that's bad. You know, not everybody here is Christian or something like that is the next and, you know, it, so every every single human being in the United States has to be Christian in order for it to be a Christian country. Well, uh, that that doesn't add up. Uh, I don't think that's what the person who says that intends either. Um, but wh where do you see um, in Europe things turning in a better direction, uh, potentially, and a more productive in terms of uh, opposing this large scale mass uh, migration? that uh, is constantly um, going on. That's a, yeah, it's a tough one because it's, uh, it's, it's like this throughout Western history. It, it's, it's never black and white. You've always got like a mosaic of every, you know, it's like swatches, you know, so many different colors and layers and it's, it's really difficult to tell. Um, I, I can tell you some trends that I like 
in Europe. And obviously, you know, one of them is, uh, I mentioned this in the book because there was a, a really large um, study uh, conducted across uh, Europe and it found that uh, most people, you know, the silent majority guys who just never seem to be able to vote the right way, um, uh, love Hungary. They love what they're doing. They think that's brilliant. It's fantastic. Uh, they did not like Sweden for some for some bizarre reason. Um, and uh, it's 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 the it's the identitarian nature of it. It's it's saying um, we need to have not this pluralism where everybody's got different definitions of justice, which sadly uh, plagues uh, modern libertarian ideas. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is why I get described as a medieval libertarian because I'm like, no, Christendom was the best one church. Everyone's got the same belief. Um, you know, memes with knights and stuff. Yes, um, but um, <laughs> but uh, in Hungary, they they have been fortunate enough in a bittersweet way to have been um, assaulted by alien ideologies for centuries um, and to have come out of it, you know, still standing, still Hungarian. And so, you know, they benefit from that, from, you know, the stories that their grandparents will tell them, you know, the cautionary tales of um, you know, how fragile our identity is, how important it is to have one shared definition of justice for everyone how important that is for public trust. Um, uh, what was the name of the guy? Is it Robert Pentin, I think? Uh, he conducted this huge study. He wrote this book uh, not that long ago and it caused quite a sensation. It was called Bowling Alone, I think. And he was studying um, trends in increasingly multicultural societies. And he found that uh, you know, public trust just nosedives as multiculturalism uh, increases. Um, Hungary don't want that. They say, we just want to remain Hungarian. And they take a lot of flack for it. You know, every time Hungary is mentioned in the British press, it has to be collocated with far right, you know, somewhere. Um, you know, just to try and give it some association with Nazism or something, you know, just try and conjure up some ideas in the audience. Um, so, I mean, okay, that is a trend that I like. I like the identitarian nature of, of Hungary. I like that they say we want to remain Christian, we want to remain Hungarian, we want to keep our language, that kind of thing. Um, Switzerland, sadly, has been um, forced, basically, by its neighboring EU countries, you know, surrounded on all sides by uh, wealthy EU countries. It's forced to change its own you know, internal guidelines for oh, transport and um, um, you know, electric, electric, the electric grid, um, you know, all kinds of different things related to trade and that sort of thing. And, and obviously, because they're a part of uh, the um, you know, Convention of Human Rights, they uh, have to take in immigrants, and then that can end up being largely dictated by the EU as well. And so they don't like it. And so their kind of nationalism is very much based on um, Christianity. As it's, it's, it's identitarian in its own right. And I suppose what I like about Switzerland is that it is very subsidiarist. You know, this principle I was saying about decision making should be made as close to the, the individual as possible in order to give them responsibility, you know, to keep your men strong and and have them continuing to make not just palming off responsibility to an insurance company or to the state, but actually taking responsibility for your neighbors directly. Um, so there's a trend that I like. Um, even in Russia, you know, evil Russia, where they're the baddie in every show and, um, yeah, and in real life. And um, uh, so what, what Putin has done uh, just recently with that awesome cathedral that he produced outside of Moscow. Um, it's just an important step in um, revitalizing the ancient European traditions where you would have the priestly uh, class, you know, the tripartite class of the ancient European world was you have the priestly class and um, 
you know, kind of working with them, but in some ways subordinate was the warrior class or the aristocratic class. Um, not aristocratic as in, you know, weak and landed gentry kind of thing, but, you know, the warriors, you know, the big boys. And uh, below that would be all of the workers, including the bourgeoisie, including bankers and merchants and stuff like that. Um, so what Putin has done there is he's, he's tried to make this really big statement of saying, yes, I'm uniting the military with the religion, with Orthodox Christianity. Um, you know, these are going to be the pillars of our country. It's, it's so confident. Um, and I love that. It's just, it's just awe inspiring. Not only is it just a gorgeous cathedral, it's, 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 it's new in some ways, but also it is very respectful of heritage and tradition. Um, and, and just that attitude in itself to want to be respectful of heritage and tradition is, is just so invaluable. Um, and, uh, yeah, beautiful, bold statement. I would love to see something like that happen elsewhere in Europe. Um, okay. Of course, um, talking more in terms of sexual morality, which is not a light matter. It is in, in many ways, it is just like number one, it is central to the sustaining of any civilization. Uh, a very famous sociologist of early last century, J.D. Unwin, he did this huge study, you know, like volumes and volumes, studying every civilization he could study and looking at their sexual ethics. And he said, you, you can, and this guy was not a Christian, but he said, you can really just establish a hierarchy here. And when you have, you know, monogamous marriage for life with courtship and all of this kind of stuff, no sex before marriage, like Christian marriage, basically proper Christian marriage. Um, that's really just at the top and anything else, it's just a step towards the slippery slope. And then you've got about two or three generations and then your civilization collapses. Um, so in terms of maintaining Christian sexual uh, morals and ethics. Well, as we know, uh, Poland and some other uh, Visig Visegrad uh, countries, Central European countries, uh, are trying to stop the you know spread of um, you know LGBT taught in schools and all that kind of thing. You know, they're, they're pretty much just making it illegal. Uh, saying no, we're just not having any of this. The reason they haven't received as much flack. Um, well, in the media, but more importantly, from uh, EU government is because um, of COVID, basically, because it's, it's just difficult, um, a little bit impractical to try and uh, level certain measures against them. And I do think that they're taking advantage of it. And that is why they're doing those things now. They're making a stand now. Um, and so I see that as being fundamentally very important. Otherwise, we end up with something like Netflix's cuties. Um, I'm sorry I mentioned it, actually. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have done this. But, but, but look, I mean, that, that is, that is, that's one of the, the stones you bump into as you're sliding down this cliff into the abyss, you know? What about the pendulum potentially swinging back the other direction when you, we see these things like cuties and stuff coming out like uh me personally it's helped me develop some skills where i can help people get off of those sort of systems and it's added to my value as an individual so i'm just curious what you think about like swinging the pendulum back in a more ethical direction i'm really sorry i don't mean to be horrible i'm not sure i'm not sure i understand the question you mean that if um do you mean that as things go that way, people will be so repulsed by things? This is going to cause such a strong reaction to things that, you know, people will suddenly rush in the opposite direction. And, um, you know, they'll be rushing back into the churches and they'll be saying, um, you know, we can't have something like cute. Is that what you mean? I'm sorry. Well, it, uh, it puts the obligation on the, you know, we do live in this hyper atomized world, but it allows for individuals to be the solution that can then help, you know, restore that culture of community and stuff like that. So 
you know, there's no denying that technology and stuff like that. It is uh, in our reality, but it's, it's inanimate in its nature. Almost. It can be used as a tool in any way. Like we can, now we can build international communities via like the web and stuff like that. People who want to be absolutely devout, they can be a beacon for each other and to re-strengthen each other back to what they find is being more productive. Does that make more sense? Yeah, I think I understand. Thank you. Um, well, what I try to explain in the book is is why I um, react very negatively in some ways towards certain attitudes in Rothbard, for instance. Um, so e even though you know Rothbard came, to, especially in his later writing, came to some really interesting conclusions um, about how libertarians have really underestimated the importance of culture. Um, uh, and I mean culture as in like shared culture, shared territorial culture like that. Um, you know, but people are born into families, they're born into uh, ethnicities, they're born into um, uh, religions, culture, this sort of thing. And the necessity of those things. And I think Jeff Deist, who's a friend of mine, I really like Jeff, um, really good guy. And he um, said in, when was his speech? I can't remember. It was a few years ago now. He, it was called the blood and soil speech. And of course, quite a stir. And he's, he said, look, you know, libertarians are going to have to come to grips with the fact that blood and soil, you know, the, the land, um, you know, things like that people would take absolutely for granted if you went to visit an Italian village, for instance. All of those things, they're so fundamentally important um, for the human psyche. I mean, I mean, for our actual health in terms of um, measurable human needs, we need those things. Um, the, the world as it is, where things are so, so, so pluralistic, that um, our our definition of justice is changing all the time, um, and and not and not in like an organic way, in a really artificial, contrived, um, and ideologically driven uh, way. Um, okay, so th this can allow th this can happen simply because um, the well, you know when, when we say when we say okay uh, the media is totally free go and start up your own Netflix it it's just not that simple it's really not that simple um, to, to to have a shared mythos in the minds of all the people so that you've all got like the same stories in your mind and then you've got this emotional connection with it. Cause you know, just saying facts at people that just doesn't work. Surely every somewhat somewhere on the scale autistic libertarian person knows this by now, you know, well, you know, when I was just shouting facts at my family, they just, they just didn't seem to get it and they just got really annoyed and, now I'm not invited to Thanksgiving or whatever it is anymore. Um, so <laughs> that, that doesn't work. You need stories. Stories are the way like you get to love the character, you get invested in the character, and then it totally bypasses all your defense mechanisms. It goes through the emotional parts of your brain. And then you find by the end of the story, you've totally changed your values. And this is why Western values have just shot off in any number of directions. Um, and you know, we, we, we don't have a shared value system anymore. You know, what is our, what is our value system now? Just hating white people. That's, that's, that's it. That's all we have in common now. Oh, that, and that's hating ourselves, I should add. Um, so <laughs> that is not the basis for, a, for a society. Okay. So, I mean, how can we solve this? You know, what, or what is the solution? Um, Again, okay, so this is why I try to promote um, the idea of Christendom. This is why I'm, I'm you know, quite explicit in the book that I think um, in order to actually have 
um, a society with libertarian principles, with 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 Western law, you know, where we have a rule of law. Um, you've got to have Christianity. And I say to people, just turn back to Christianity. If people just started going back, filling the churches, putting those stories in their kids' head again, um, cutting out all of the bad stuff, uh, then things will be fine. Um, and, you know, okay, so I, I'm, I'm a Catholic as well. So um, how can I put this? I mean, the advantage, of, uh, the advantage I see with Catholicism is that you have... Um, uh, like, like a hierarchy to this as well. So you've got like really smart guys working on and analyzing, okay, this book's going to be really bad for your children. This is no good. And, you know, and all these guys, you know, I mean, these guys have got YouTube channels as well. Um, you've know, got bishops and stuff and they got all their own YouTube channels and they're analyzing movies and all sorts of stuff. And you are right. Okay. Christians, and I'm talking broadly. Okay. If you're Protestant, you're Orthodox. Okay. You're still my brother, that kind of thing. So, there are loads of Christian channels and we're trying to be vigilant and that kind of thing. But the point is the masses are easily led. 80% of people do not have original thoughts. That's very scary, but it's true. Okay. Um, so they are very easily led. They are sheep. And if, if you have malevolent forces in control of pretty much every cultural platform there is, and you are barred because of ideological reasons from getting your foot in the door, where do you go from there? Um, now, of course, some people would want to resort to um, you know, full-blown uh, statism, some kind of fascism, that kind of thing. Um, for me, um, I, I think that's going to be doomed to fail if it doesn't have, at the top of it, Christianity. Um, you know, any fascist experiments or anything like that, that that existed, where they were trying to restore the natural order and they were trying to restore traditional institutions and they were trying to, you know, get, get the people back to Christianity and, you know, explaining all the reasons to the people for that publicly. Um, uh, that, that was always much more sustainable and that, that was healthier. Um, where it's just about, you know, will to power or something like that, um, it just unravels. And I mean, e even even if, let's say, um, you know, let's say, for example, like um, Man in the High Castle style, the, you know, the Germans had won World War II. Um, I, I think that a lot of, you know, really wise um, uh, historians were right in saying that, you know, come the 1960s and, and that sort of thing, you'd have had revolutions happening, you'd have had people changing their minds and the state would have been used for some other project and some other purpose further down the line. Uh, so you're still stuck with the problem of not having a definite, transcendent, God-given definition of justice. You're, you're still just blowing around with the wind. Sorry for the long answer there, but yeah, I find um, the solution I just in Hungary, I find what uh, Poland has done in the same kind of situation where they have been invaded by other alien foreign enemies and cultures for, well, for most of their uh, origin stories um, from the West and the East where they're centrally located. And they will have none of it. And they will have their banners out there marching uh, no to communism, to fascism, uh, no to, to anything, but Poland and Polish people and their culture and their heritage. And they even came out to a vote, like who is king of Poland? And Jesus Christ is uh, what they came out with. Jesus Christ is king of Poland. And as a result of his keeping it for themselves uh, and not bowing to the EU, they don't have not incurred to the wrath of these uh, foreigners uh, that are anti-Catholic, anti-Christian, anti-Western uh, immigrant invaders coming in there and, uh, and terrorizing their communities and having terrorist attacks. And they don't uh, incur any of those consequences that many other countries uh, have, like France, for example. And like during that 
one uh, opera or show in which like they came in and just murdered uh, like over a hundred people. Uh, and that's just a frequent thing that happens now in those kind of countries. That's a, uh, what do they say? That's the part and parcel now of living in a big city. As mm-hmm. uh, they say, even, um, in England and London, but that, um, that Muslim air, um, do you wish that, um, that, uh, Americans sort of finished a job and, uh, crossed the Atlantic? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to elaborate. During, after the American Revolutionary War, so the uh, so Americans had finished the job and crossed the Atlantic and liberated England, and then you'd have a nice rifle. So- <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, oh, um, I'm in vain. Sa- I mean, in some ways, I do kind of wish that you know Donald Trump was like the emperor, you know. Got, you know, God Emperor Trump kind of thing. Right. Um, What's well, the name from that uh, series, Warhammer? Right? Warhammer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what more could I say without getting into trouble? Right. Um, <laughs> please, please um, on your door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in this country. Do I have a license for that? Um, right. I, I yeah. do want to say that earlier you were mentioning something about like this... Uh, this uh, area that people do need to have uh, land, right? The Polish have had that area. Irish have have a tiny island in which they want to bring in, you know, tens of thousands of non-Irish people in there, right? Uh, and in a way to replace the native population, right? And we always take a look at that here in America, like, yeah, that's bad. And when you look at Europe, you know, people think that's good. Um, but there's this interesting story that reminds me of how entrenched, like, the people there are of many reasons around the world of the, the land that they're from, like even the Japanese and even in England, there's a man called the Cheddar Man uh, in which they, <laughs> the, the remains in a skeletal cave, 9,000 years old, and they got DNA from a tooth and they were able to analyze that and they connected it to his living relative, 9,000 years later, living less than a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> English school teacher. So like his generations of at that point, it's like thousands of relatives that had to come together over those 9,000 years. And he's still there, right? He's still living there on that land and that, that connection that they have to that land. I think that's a uh, part and tied to their culture. But now people want to say like, uh, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't belong to you. It, you know, belongs to the world. Anyone should be able to come there and, and take over that, that hyper, uh, atomized individualism that you're mentioning, but other places in the rest of the world don't view it that way, right? The Japanese, uh, even the Israelis have, um, you have to have, uh, they do a blood sample. You have to be Israel, a Jew to live in Israel. You know, Japan has, it's very strict, you know, they want to keep it for themselves. Uh, they've seen what happens, I guess, in terms of multicultural societies and how it just implodes itself and the trust boundary kind of disintegrates um, as a way to protect themselves. Yeah, and I find that, True, like the best way to, if you see how Poland has reacted to these um, developments over the past 10 years, that other countries have forsaken, like France has gone very secular and now Notre Dame is burning and you have hundreds of churches being, uh, every year, uh, vandalized, destroyed, put to fire. It's no coincidence that that started, be, started happening when they started bringing in anti-Western immigrants into their own country and have forsaken God and have forsaken their religion and their culture and has become more culture relativist. And you look at that and you look at Poland and look, it's the answer is right there. All right. Uh, embrace God, embrace your culture and your country and uh, your people. You know, you, you can hate government, but you can still love, you know, being Polish in Poland. Right. Um, I think uh, you look at Liechtenstein as a monarcho Catholic uh, German um, country. And even in their ruling systems, any part of that community has a right to vote themselves out of it. And that's instilled in their law. And they can at any point say that the prince is not their prince, um, but they all refuse to because they will want to, that's, they find that that culture is very important for them. And that's what has caused them to survive as a people. And why, stop uh, something that's always worked.
You know, you've talked yeah. like, uh, like or it's hard for people to have original ideas, but, um, or sometimes take the risk to do something crazy. You know, the, not everyone's successful at that. I think conservatism and some of these traditionalism, there's something about ideas that work. And these are traditions that you can pass on to generations to ensure that it'll work for them and you'll have a life and a family and that you don't have to do anything crazy to still be prosperous and continue to pass it down generations, generations. Um, and it works for everyone. Not everyone has to have an original joke or an original idea, but at least this traditionalism uh, that's been passed down can ensure that you will have at least a good life for yourself and your family. Yes, very well put. Very well put. Exactly. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I don't know why. When you were talking just now, I was thinking again about the the Italian village, and you know, it, it's it will seem alien to us coming from an Anglo culture, but every week in in you know many villages throughout Italy, they will take their children to the cemetery. You know, going to the cemetery once a week is is just a normal thing. And so the children, it's, it's, it's not just getting them used to death, you know, like, let's get a pet so the child learns about death. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's so much more than that. It's about having them understand where they have come from, their, their real sense of place. It's, it, they are rooted in this place. It's giving them a much more solid identity, but also it's implicitly helping them to understand. And they might not know that they're doing this by taking them to the cemetery. But, but what's happening is they're understanding that the family um, is, is about facilitating life, but also death as well, these necessary things. It's, and it, it gives you an understanding of respecting your ancestors which is something, you know, very fundamental and ancient to European people. You know, Roman law was fundamentally built on the household and the hearth, and the, the hearth, the fire, which had to be continued by the oldest son upon the death of the father. Um, it would have been surrounded. I'm looking at uh, my, my fireplace now. I have pictures of family there. The, the fireplace, the hearth, sorry, would have been surrounded with... Um, you know, statues and maybe images and things to remind you of your ancestors. And the fire was seen as a way of um, kind of being united with your your ancestors. You were able to communicate or ask for assistance through your ancestors through the fire. And that was really central to, to all, you know, Roman law. It started with that. Um, and it kind of ended with that in as, well, as well, because, you know, with the concern for the, the, the common good, it grew out of the family. It was something very organic. It started with the, the organic relationships within the family built on unconditional love from the mother, which is really primordial for the human mind um, in terms of getting a sense of, of self and the other. That begins in the womb. And uh, of course, us here talking now, we wouldn't, none of us would be here talking now unless at some point we had had the unconditional love of a mother or perhaps some other guardian looking after us. Um, and so it, it's, it's about getting the child to have this really full sense of who they are, where they are. And, and you know, the thought of uh, Sir Roger Scruton comes to mind as well. You know, his, his philosophy is really all about the home. He talks about the home a lot. And what that means, what does that mean, home? Um, you know, what do words like cozy, what do they mean? What are they describing about ourselves? What are these feelings? What are these needs that we have? Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, sadly, like I said before, we, we Europeans, uh, because we're a bit more psychopathic, um, we, we can just, we, we, we are seduced very easily by ideas like, um, I will forsake everything. I'm forsaking the gene pool and my own genes just so that I can look good and tell people I'm not, you know, that is just crazy. But, um, you know, we are, we are so very easily seduced by this. And so... Um, I, I, I think that a good step forward would be to have in the home uh, lots of habits where we are being more productive and we are, we are really understanding you know, what it is that we're trying to facilitate there with the family. Because the family is really the last bastion against 
the modern state and all of the artificial relationships it seeks to create and control. Um, you know, the family is really where it begins with those organic relationships. And so having stronger families, of course, you know, something else facilitated by Christianity, um, and making ourselves more productive, not just consumers consuming stuff all the time, consuming shows, consuming food, really trying to make stuff, repair stuff. Um, and I know you're always making posts like this, Cal. I love some of your posts. Um, it's, it's, it's really good for us to be fostering this in each other because that, that is really the last line of defense that we have. Um, so that was a little bit of a rant, but um, you just made me think of those things there. No, yeah, I think the family unit is uh, one of the best guards we have against the state or falling to complete socialism. Uh, it's the thing that uh, the state wants to replace itself with. Um, you know, the sexual revolution you're talking about, monogamy, marriage, and all that stuff. You know, the state of divorce rates have uh, like increased dramatically since since then. Um, and then there's there's scientific features that has been shown to to find a, a lot of interesting reasons for that. Um, in terms of like the more partners a woman has, like especially after like five and above, like happiness starts to drop. Uh, it's unable to for them to create like um, those bonds. You know, it, it's not impossible, but it makes it more difficult. And then you just have you fall into like divorces and divorces and divorces, twice divorce, thrice divorces. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, the family unit and the way the, the state kind of handicaps a lot of marriages and saying like. Uh, like there was an incident, I think it happened maybe in England where it was just a long-term relationship and they broke up, but she still has to pay alimony. So has to pay $10,000 uh, to this, to this woman. People say maybe this is uh, Robert Williams, um, Robin Williams uh, reason for killing himself. Right. But he's twice divorced and he has to give out like millions of dollars. But, but I, I don't think it's so much rests on the, the involvement of the state or the woman. I think at the end of the day, it kind of still kind of revolves itself on the man choosing uh, a wholesome woman uh, to be his wife. And you find some interesting statistics that show, show that if it's just the father or in the son, if it's like divorce, um, the child would become at least uh, like 50% that religion. If it's just the mother and the son or the ch child, uh, the child to be, to be that religion drops down to like 20 to 30%. If it's the father and the mother going to church regularly together and they have children, the children uh, could be, still be religious, uh, still continues to shoot up, right? So I think at the end of the day, even though the wife, the woman doesn't court the man, and at the same time, maybe a uniqueness still in Western civilization that she can say yes or no, right, versus elsewhere in the world, uh, that 51% of, I guess you can say, relationship power comes down to the man because the man is the one who pursues the woman and courts her. And, and at the end of the day, chooses who's going to be uh, his wife and who's going to create this family with. Uh, and then like to make sure that they have the similar values or at least talk about it beforehand, before you start <laughs> into marriage and, and everything else that comes out there. I think it's super important. Um, so I think uh, an attack on Western civilization, reason a lot of people are experiencing this attack on masculinity. Uh, it's attack on what it is to, you know, calling it virtual or toxic. Um, and I think that's something that we could probably talk about in, in another episode. You know, it's just the whole Gillette thing. Uh, you know, boys will be boys and just kind of trying to emasculate men and uh, saying that, you know, even going to the gym is toxic. You know, it's, it's, it's horrific how many different fronts uh, Western civilization is being attacked from, not just on cultural guilt, but in every aspect of the pillars that has built that. Um, so in a way, I do like that Peyton is uh, creating that church and bringing that back. You look at the numbers, Orthodox Christians were dramatically low after he took over. Uh, it, it skyrocketed. Uh, or maybe that could have been the inevitable result after the collapse of uh, USSR, right? Because they held back and, you know, they buried their relics and everything like that. And maybe it inevitably would have gone. But it certainly does help to have someone that is pro-Orthodox to help keep pushing that in that direction. versus. Uh, someplace circular like France or other anti-Christian countries, as it were, that used to be. But we're coming close to our hour here. Uh, do you guys have any more questions? Or I had a, I had a funny quote um, from comic Dave Smith. 
a popular libertarian podcaster. He said, he tweeted, a lot of childless single women aren't disgusted by cuties because they're basically sexualized children themselves. And I just thought that was pretty dead on. You know, a lot of people are living like Absolutely. kids. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Definitely. I agree 100%. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that is exactly what it is. Um, uh, you know, and this is, this is why you see a lot, of, a lot of young guys on the dissident right, they are um, very, you know, they'll say, look, the problem is not cultural Marxism. The problem is cultural capitalism. Okay. And they'll say that. Why? Because they'll say, um, you know, the big businesses, you know, they're all in for the woke capitalism, you know, sort of joined hands, you know, materialist hands with the other form of liberals, you know, the young leftists. Um, they're, they're happy about this because, you know, women make up like, is it 80%, I think, of market spending. Um, when you have these women just not like, taking responsibility, not being responsible, not, not, not raising a family. And you say, oh, you don't want to be a slave to a man. You know, you want to be a slave in an office somewhere. It's so much better. Um, and they can just buy toys. They just buy stuff they just don't need for themselves. And they just, you know, it, it, just, it just fuels the Keynesian economy. You know, that, 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 is, that is fundamentally why uh, there's been such a big push, you know, to get women out into the into the workforce. Uh, here in England, they put a lot of money into helping out childcare institutions. And they were, this was a conservative government as well, I should say. And they were totally open about it. They said, well, it's because we want to get more women out in the workforce for economic reasons. They were completely open about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's hit the nail on the head there. Um, I think that, you know, if, if we are to take uh, libertarianism seriously in the proper sense of the word. Libertarianism doesn't mean Austrian economics. Libertarianism is a theory of law. We're talking about the rule of law and, and principles of law here. If we're to take, you know, real freedom, you know, political freedom seriously at all, I think we're going to have to start addressing some of these um, critiques of capitalism by uh, young guys on the dissident right, guys like uh, Keith Woods. I don't know if you're familiar with him, Keith Woods. Um, anyway, folks like that. Right. There's um, they forget that capitalism is this uh, economic system, right? Property rights, and I think from it, uh, if you just have restrain it and uh, contain it, you know, some of the ill negative things that come out like Netflix. It's that's that's the root of it. That's where it comes from. Uh, but like my good friend John was saying, uh, it's, it's, all it is is the skeletal structure. It's the economic system. You need Christianity to fill in the rest. And in terms of the values uh, that, that we have, and that will kind of permeate itself through businesses and uh, other kinds of works that people do in a market. Um, like Brazil, for example, <laughs> um, Netflix at one point tried to disperse Jesus in a Netflix show and uh, immediately banned. It went to an appeals court. I think it got overturned, but like the country was like, no, you know, and banned. And, uh, and that had an effect on Netflix. Right. So it's interesting where it can survive. You know, you're not going to have uh, uh, Netflix in uh, the middle East or something like that. You know, it's, it's interesting where some of these ideas, they allow it to happen here. Like some of this LGBT friendly, um, companies will put the color mode model or flag on their game companies and Twitter handles in Western countries, but in Middle Eastern countries, you know, they keep it the same and, you know, they, they know the, the reaction of that. Um, but I want to thank you for coming on the show. Finally, Richard story. I think it's a uh, great enlightening to have these kind of discussions and to continue uh, the work towards saving the West. People say that, you know, maybe, it is salvageable. You have an interesting point at the end of your book about what we can do to save it. And I think we are at that interesting time where that is our role to save the West and uh, bring it back to its glory and bring it back towards God. So thank you for having you, having uh, us and, and our time here together. And hopefully one day we can uh, cross the Atlantic and uh, help crusade uh, England. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually going to bring the emperor over. <laughs> that, that would be nice. Don't tell the queen I said that, but that might be nice. 
Yeah. Listening. No, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Finally, right? I've been meaning to come on for ages. It's been really great. Um, yeah, I hope I didn't say anything too naughty. Oh, no, you're great. You're great. For those listening, uh, stay liberated. Get off my property. Current guns, not money. And God bless. <laughs>